Hey y'all, the first thing that we're gonna talk about today is, you know, we make a big deal about cancel culture here in the US, but the UK takes it to a whole nother fucking level. Right, so this news story goes back to the start of the pandemic when Captain Sir Tom Moore, a British Army officer, walked 100 laps around his garden before his 100th birthday. Right, we talked about it on the show, he ended up raising 33 million pounds for NHS charities, becoming a national inspiration, even getting knighted by the Queen. His famous saying, tomorrow will be a good day, trending on social media. But then, almost a year later, he died from the coronavirus, the Queen leading tributes, and his daughter saying they shared laughter and tears with him in his final hours. And what we ended up seeing is the next day after Moore's death, while everyone else was mourning, there was one 36-year-old guy who was apparently celebrating, with Joseph Kelly tweeting, the only good Brit soldier is a dead one. Burn, old fella, burn. Which I think rightly could result in a lot of people going, hey, fuck yourself, guy. But the truly insane part of this story, at least to me, is that prosecutors actually ended up charging Kelly for sending a grossly offensive tweet, with the court finding him guilty and threatening him with jail time. And this because of the UK's 2003 Communications Act, which made it illegal to send messages of a quote, grossly offensive or of an indecent, obscene or menacing character. So all your tweets from 10 years ago, with in fact hundreds of people having been prosecuted under the law over the past two decades. Like with Azar Ahmed, who got community service and a fine for a Facebook post similar to Kelly's tweet, writing people gassing about the deaths of soldiers. What about the innocent families who have been brutally murdered? Your enemies were the Taliban, not innocent, harmless families. And ending that by saying all soldiers should die and go to hell. And then as far as what happened to Kelly, he was just sentenced for his tweet yesterday, being given 18 months of supervision and 150 hours of community service. And that, despite the fact that he deleted the post just 20 minutes after making it. With the sheriff who sentenced him saying, the deterrence is really to show people that despite the steps you took to try and recall matters, as soon as you press the blue button, that's it. It's important for others to realize how quickly things can get out of control. And as far as the other side, he would Kelly's defense agent saying, he accepts he was wrong. He did not anticipate what would happen. He took steps almost immediately to delete the tweet, but the genie was out of the bottle by then. And saying his level of criminality was a drunken post at a time when he was struggling emotionally, which he regretted and almost instantly removed. And ultimately this story just makes me think, what the fuck? Fuck. Like, I don't doubt that Kelly is a despicable douchebag, but potentially getting jail time for this is crazy to me. Genuinely horrifying. Y'all, I understand, maybe that's all the America still in my veins, but this is something that feels like it's handled by the court of public opinion. A, a private company can decide if they want to platform that or not, but for the actual government to potentially put you in jail, bonkers. But because this is the Philip DeFranco show, that's a story, my opinion, and of course I pass the question on to you. What are your thoughts here, especially if you are a Brit yourself? You only make up a little over 6% of the audience, but that's a pretty big polling pool. And then in the latest edition of a YouTuber carelessly shilling some NFT that ultimately gets rug pulled, people losing millions of dollars, we have David Dobrik in the news, which inherently is a bad story, but also kind of a positive for David. It's a little bit of an upgrade since the first story in the news about him that doesn't involve someone from his team allegedly raping someone or him almost killing his friend. So long story short, you had David Dobrik pushing this NFT project called Board Bunny. And then you have multiple people saying the project gets rug pulled, right? Everyone that's holding the NFTs is essentially just left holding the bag. This leading to creators like Zach XBT, who has a pretty substantial following for posting about influencer crypto deals and scams, sharing a video and adding, welcome David Dobrik to the long list of influencers promoting scams. And further claiming the team has disappeared with $6 million. And in response to that, we saw another creator very big in the crypto space, FaZe Banks, responding to that tweet, saying of that team, they offered me $500 to $750,000 up front for a story post slash follow, saying the only reason he didn't take it is because he educated himself on it, and adding a lot of these influencers take deals brought to them by their management slash treated as a product campaign. But that was a few days ago, and now the biggest update here is that FaZe Banks apparently ended up recording an episode of Views, David Dobrik's podcast, with Banks sharing an Instagram story making it sound like they hashed out the whole ordeal on the episode. And in these stories, he claims that David didn't even understand everything, saying that while that doesn't make it right, it at least adds some context, saying he tried to educate David, and ultimately they came up to a resolution on a make good for his misstep, which sounded like David being willing to distribute the roughly $100,000 that he received for this push back into the ecosystem. Though for some, there's gonna be the question of, is that enough? Yes, he was apparently paid around $100,000 for this deal. This is gonna mean that he makes no profit from this, but how much damage was done to his fans or people that thought, oh, David Dobrik's involved, this is legitimate. But ultimately, I think where I'll end this story is with two notes. One, if you're someone that you see these influencers shilling NFTs, I think most of you are smart enough to, to not be like, oh, I guess like, here's my credit card. I know with my audience specifically, a lot of you hate it, but also a lot of you, I think, if you're involved in the space, you're doing your research. But also, two creators, I understand that over a career, you're like, you're not ever going to be perfect. Mistakes will be made, wrong partnerships will happen, but especially in the NFT space, there's just a lot of dumb money getting thrown around for a lot of weird, shady, like worthless shit. Just from a statistical standpoint, there is a higher risk here. And then let's talk about updates around Will Smith, Chris Rock, and that Oscars slap, though I'm, I'm gonna keep it very 
very brief. Because, you know, at this point, it feels like everything that needed to be said has been said at this point. It's been four days. I agree with Daniel Radcliffe. Like, how many other celebrities do we need to ask, like, what their opinion is on this so people can get angry at them? But some of the updates, uh, the Academy is saying, we tried slash we're trying, right? Having previously announced a review into this situation. We also saw the Academy saying, hey, we actually asked Will Smith to leave, but he refused. Calling Smith's actions deeply shocking and traumatic to witness and apologizing to Chris, thanking him for his resilience in that moment. But also, at the same time, you have reports coming out saying, no, the Academy is lying. With TMZ saying a source said there was a split among the officials. Some did want him booted, but others did not. There were various discussions during several commercial breaks, but they never reached a consensus. With the sources adding, Will was aware there was talk about asking him to leave the theater, but TMZ noting during one of the commercial breaks, we're told Oscars producer Will Packer walked up to Will and said, we do not want you to leave. Now reporting that Packer walked up to Smith 35 minutes after the slap, which was five minutes before he was awarded best actor. Also, regarding the review, the group said that Will has been given 15 days notice of a vote regarding potential consequences. Right, the Academy is saying that options include suspension or expulsion, though I think the general consensus is that he won't get expelled or even lose his award or any, anything like that. Which, well, I think there are some, I don't think a lot of people are pushing for. Also, I've seen plenty of people talking about or asking, you know, have people actually been expelled from the Academy? Actually, yes, but the situations were far different, right? You have Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, and Roman Polanski being expelled. Or what Smith did was wrong, but it's not sexual assault. Also, as expected, Chris Rock did speak out on the incident last night, though keeping it very simple. With him returning to touring in Boston last night, he was met with a massive standing ovation from the crowd. With reports saying that standing O apparently lasted two minutes until Chris finally got a word in and said, you got me all misty and shit. And later saying, I don't have a bunch of shit about what happened. So if you came to hear that, I have a whole show I wrote before this weekend and I'm still kind of processing what happened. So at some point I'll talk about that shit and it'll be serious and it'll be funny. I'm going to tell some jokes. It's nice just to be out. Which one, absolutely makes sense. And two, had to be so disappointing for the people that were shelling out thousands of dollars for tickets that were previously going for tens and hundreds of dollars. And the final thing that I'll touch on here is there is now a new angle of the smack, thus a new narrative has been born. It's taken from behind, so you can't see Jada's face, but it shows Will walking away, Chris then making his joke, and Jada then leaning in as though she's laughing. But they're kind of being two avenues of thought here. One, people saying, oh, this shows that she just loved that Will smacked him. Others saying, oh, maybe she even thought that it was fake. But yeah, ultimately that's everything for now. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Seed. So everything that I thought I knew about probiotics was wrong, and Seed is the real deal. They combine a probiotic and a prebiotic to form their DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic, and it's designed to support gut health and support whole body health. And honestly, y'all, after the last two months, like I'm horrified by the thought of missing taking my prebiotic and probiotic every day. And with Seed, their unique capsule design uses an outer prebiotic capsule that protects the inner probiotic through digestion pass your stomach acid for 100% survivability into your colon. Most other probiotics actually die in your stomach. And Seed goes beyond gut health to help promote clear and glowing skin and heart health, but I have to say, I feel the most support in my gut health since using it. Healthy regularity, ease of bloating, and more, it's truly remarkable the difference that you can feel. And hey, you can try it risk-free. Also, in your first month, you get this refillable glass jar, a travel glass vial, and a 30-day supply, and after that, they send sustainable refills. So go to seed.com slash defranco and use code defranco to get 15% off your first month's supply of Seed's DSO-1 daily symbiotic plus free shipping. And then, you know, sometimes we get news stories about criminals and I'm like, okay, you're definitely our douchebag of the day, but also this is so ridiculous. I kind of got to tip my hat to you. And that is the case with this former Yale administrator named Jamie who ripped off the university for almost a decade. Right, so as the director of finance and administration for the Department of Emergency Medicine, she had the authority to make purchases for the department as long as those purchases were under $10,000. And it turns out since at least 2013 and continuing through last year, she bought thousands of computers and other electronics using the school's money and then arranged to ship the stolen hardware to a business in New York for a profit once they were resold. And according to investigators, she got away with this for so long because she would report to the school that the equipment was for specific needs like medical studies that ultimately didn't exist. And despite suspicions being raised by the high volume of orders in June of 2020, she explained it by saying she was just updating the school's computer equipment. With Yale's total final losses coming in at over $40 million and Jamie spent that money. Reportedly using it to travel, buy several homes and purchase luxury cars, including two Mercedes Benz, two Cadillac Escalades, a Dodge Charger and Range Rover, which also, how did she get away with that? No one wondered how this school administrator was balling like a rapper. Because y'all, she only ended up getting caught last August when Yale officials received an anonymous tip. And so now we ultimately just have to wait to see what her sentence is because she's pled guilty to a tax offense and two counts of wire fraud. And so that's why, Jamie, you are our douchebag of the day, but also, Kind of impressive. And yes, I'm only saying that because it's not my money. If it was my money, you would be in the ground. Maybe, hypothetically, it's a joke. Or is it? 
And then finally today, let's talk about Russia, Ukraine, and it's almost all bad news. There are the totally not worrying reports that the Russian troops who attacked Chernobyl had no idea where they were and what the plant was at that time. And since then, many reportedly have demanded to pull out of the area after they realized they kicked up a bunch of radioactive dust and some have come down with acute radiation poisoning. But easily the biggest situation right now is still the siege of Mariupol. It continues to hold out, although a ceasefire was allegedly put in place by Russia to let civilians out. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, the corridor was open to 10 a.m. local time and quote, for this humanitarian operation to succeed, we propose to carry it out with the direct participation of the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and the International Committee of the Red Cross. And to this end, Ukraine has sent dozens of buses to try and get civilians out, but as of recording, it's unclear how successful that has been, although there are increasing reports that fighting is still ongoing, which, I mean, this wouldn't be the first time a ceasefire has been promised in the area, and if it fails, it also wouldn't be a total surprise. Unfortunately, that's just how this war has been going. Also, speaking of broken promises, it appears that those negotiations in Turkey have actually led to nothing. We talked about one of the major things from there was a promise by Russia to heavily tone down attacks against Kyiv, but according to the Turkish foreign minister, there's little evidence that agreement is being implemented. And NATO continues to say that this entire agreement really wasn't about withdrawing troops from the area, but instead Russia just repositioning and rotating troops in the field. So it's not a shock that we continue to see offensives by both sides in key battle zones, including around Kyiv. Also, regarding troops, there's a good chance that a lot more Russian troops are going to be committed against Ukraine as Putin signed a decree calling for nearly 150,000 conscripts. Though the Russian government claims these conscripts won't be used against Ukraine and were completely unrelated to the war. But even if that's the case, they open the possibility of more veteran troops from different areas of Russia being sent there, especially because it looks like Russia's troops in Ukraine need backup if Russia is going to achieve its ever-shifting goal especially because the reports of Russian casualties have already surpassed what the country lost in 10 years worth of war in Afghanistan. Then, on the economic front, things are expected to be rough not only for Ukraine and Russia, but possibly around the world. The European Bank of Reconstruction and Development estimating that Russia's economy will shrink by 10%, while Ukraine's will fall by 20%, claiming that the war has triggered the greatest supply shock in 50 years. And it's all especially concerning since both Russia and Ukraine are massive suppliers of commodities around the world, with the war expected to have a massively negative effect on emerging economies in Africa and the Middle East. But the final thing that I want to hit on is going back to Ukraine and talking about the devastation Right now, the UN reports that over 4 million people have fled Ukraine with its refugee agency saying, we are confronted with the realities of a massive humanitarian crisis that is growing by the second. And that's just the people who have managed to leave. With the UN pointing out there are still millions more displaced within Ukraine and that around 13 million people are thought to be stranded and unable to leave in fighting zones. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. And as always, thank you for watching, subscribing, and being a part of these daily dives into the news. My name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you next time.